In video one, I described the foundations of transaction cost economics, or TCE, noting that Oliver Williamson's key contribution was to identify three characteristics of any transaction that affect the ease with which we can govern that transaction through the market. The three dimensions are asset specificity, which is the degree to which an asset is valuable in only one specific use with one specific exchange partner, uncertainty, and frequency. So what exactly does TCE predict? The basic prediction is exactly the same as Ronald Coase's assertion from 1937. A transaction will be governed by whichever form of organization is the most efficient governance form for that transaction. But by dimensionalizing transactions according to asset specificity, uncertainty, and frequency, TCE avoids the problem of tautology. The theory's basic predictions are most easily understood in terms of the theory's canonical transaction, vertical exchange in a supply chain. And we will use a simple graph to help outline the predictions. In this graph, the x-axis represents asset specificity, and the y-axis represents governance cost, the cost of governing a transaction. We will draw two curves, one representing market governance, we will call that M, and one representing hierarchical governance, H. First, drawing on basic economic theory, a market is the optimal governance form for transactions that are low in asset specificity. At the limit, spot market transactions have almost no upfront costs. For example, we don't have to spend time and effort writing a contract. And markets provide high incentives to each party to work hard to maximize profit. As long as I will not become dependent on you, and thus vulnerable to hold up, and vice versa, the market enables us to transact efficiently. And if we have a disagreement, it's almost costless to find another actor with whom to transact. Second, as asset specificity increases, the cost of transacting through the market rises. When I must invest in a specific asset to transact with you, I begin to worry about being held up after I invest. It would still be great to transact on the spot market so that we don't have to spend time and effort writing a contract. But now, if we have a disagreement, it is costly and may be impossible for me to find someone else with whom to transact. So, as asset specificity increases, I may require a longer-term contract with increasingly complicated terms and restrictions, thus raising the cost of negotiating an arrangement. And I may be compelled to devote more resources to monitoring and enforcing the agreement, adding to the costs, and I still always bear some risk that you will renege, which is an intangible but important probabilistic cost. And you may have sim similar costs on your side. At the limit, these costs may be so high that they overwhelm the potential benefit of investing in the specific asset and engaging in the transaction. Now consider an alternative form of governance, vertical integration. Compared to the spot market or a long-term contract, vertical integration has high upfront fixed costs. It's not cheap to buy a supplier or to build one's own supply in-house. So, when asset specificity is low, vertical integration is far more costly than market governance. As asset specificity increases, the cost of governing a transaction through vertical integration increases, but it increases much more slowly than the cost of governing that transaction through the market. As noted above, as asset specificity increases, the hazards of market contracting become ever more dangerous. But if we are two divisions of the same firm, then I'm much less worried. At the limit, if you and I have a disagreement, we can petition our boss and she can tell you to cut it out. Thus, for transactions characterized by high levels of asset specificity, vertical integration is a more efficient governance form than markets. Uncertainty exacerbates the impact of asset specificity, meaning that if we hold the level of asset specificity constant, the relative benefit of vertical integration versus market transactions increases as uncertainty increases. Frequency is predicted to make vertical integration more likely, simply because the high upfront fixed costs of vertical integration are cheaper on a per-occurrence basis if a transaction occurs many times instead of once. Thus, TCE yields two fundamental predictions and two moderating predictions regarding the canonical transaction of make versus buy, or market versus hierarchy. Prediction one, transactions characterized by low asset specificity will be governed in the market. In this area, my furniture firm and your railroad can contract. Prediction two, transactions characterized by high asset specificity will be governed within the firm, that is, vertical integration or hierarchy. In this area, I may have to build my own rail line 
or you and I may have to merge to make this transaction occur. Prediction three, the level of asset specificity at which optimal governance switches from market to hierarchy will be lower in situations of high environmental uncertainty than in low environmental uncertainty. Prediction four, the level of asset specificity at which optimal governance switches from market to hierarchy will be lower when the transaction occurs with higher frequency. Finally, as noted in video one, TCE scholars have proposed a fourth characteristic of transactions that affects governance, appropriability of knowledge. Even in a setting where asset specificity is low, I might prefer to govern a transaction inside my firm if I'm afraid that you will gain access to my valuable knowledge if I transact with you through the market. This leads to prediction five. Transactions characterized by weak appropriability, or put differently, a high risk of knowledge leakage, will be governed in the firm. Since the 1980s, a tremendous body of empirical research has confirmed these predictions, and particularly the predictions related to asset specificity and appropriability, in a range of industries and activities. For example, studies of the manufacturing of automobiles, aircraft, and computers, the sales and marketing of electronic components and insurance, the development of pharmaceuticals, telecommunications equipment, and semiconductors, the ownership of vehicles and vessels in trucking, railroads, steamship transport, and airlines, just to name a few. It's been quite the empirical success story. At some point, there's not much novelty in finding that TCE explains vertical integration in yet another industry. So what next? Eventually, scholars began to extend these basic predictions to settings other than the make versus buy decision and began to study solutions other than explaining the boundaries of the firm. David Teese proposed that the basic insights of TCE should also apply to corporate diversification. Whereas the theory of economies of scope suggested that a firm should diversify in order to exploit any scope economies in production, Teese noted that in a world without transaction costs, the firm could simply contract out its relevant excess production capacity, thus tapping scope economies without needing to change its firm boundaries. Analogous to vertical integration, diversification should only be efficient if it rests on specific assets that are afflicted by contractual hazards, or if it rests on knowledge that might be expropriated if the firm tries to exploit the knowledge through contracts. Scholars also proposed a similar approach to understanding multinational expansion. A French firm can sell its cheese in the U.S by exporting to an independent company in the U.S., or it can set up its own U.S. subsidiary. How will the firm choose? Based on transaction cost reasoning, the prediction is clear. The French firm should prefer to export as long as the required asset specificity or the risk of knowledge expropriation is low. But as asset specificity or appropriability concerns increase, it will reach a point after which it should prefer to build a subsidiary in the U.S., essentially integrating this activity. Transaction cost logic has also been fleshed out to explicate several governance options in between the poles of spot market and integration. Interfirm alliances have been a topic of huge and enduring interest since the 1990s. How can we explain when a firm chooses to undertake some activity via an alliance rather than through the market contract or entirely in-house? TCE has a prediction. Transactions that are characterized by intermediate levels of asset specificity and thus benefit from both moderate levels of intense incentives, but also moderate controls to support coordinated activity and reduce fears of holdup, will be ripe for alliances. And the theory offers predictions regarding the level of hierarchy within alliances. TCE scholars have proposed that increased asset specificity, increased risk of knowledge expropriation, and increased complexity of transacting will lead partners to arrange more firm-like alliances whereas alliances without these features will be governed mostly through complex contracts. Those with these features will include equity investments and at the limit, standalone joint ventures in which each partner has veto power over many decisions. Again, numerous empirical studies find evidence consistent with these extensions of TCE to diversification, multinational expansion, and alliances. TCE has also been extended to a huge swath of other settings, ranging from franchising to regulatory regimes to bureaucracy to the prevalence of diamond engagement rings. In all cases, though, the fundamental predictions of TCE draw from the same basic logic. Economic actors will align transactions, which differ in their attributes, with governance structures, the costs and competencies of which differ, in a discriminating and mainly transaction cost economizing way, where the key transaction attributes are asset specificity and appropriability, 
and the key governance features are incentive intensity and coordinated adaptation. And the empirical research finds this pattern repeatedly. In the next video, I ask, so what? Is there any evidence that firms perform better when they adhere to these principles?